a congressperson up in D.C. working on these issues. He was the, uh, the person that was crying from the mountaintop, even in 2006, about where we were going as a country and how we had to change our direction if we were going to be able to sustain uh, the plans that we have to make America a great country again despite this recession. So with no further ado, a man that needs no introduction, Congressman <laughs> Paul Ryan. And Dawn, thanks for opening up uh, your great facility to us. Really appreciate it. We are in the belly of the bastion here. <laughs> and, and no doubt we're on Blaine Street. <laughs> wow. I never thought I'd see a day where we'd be doing a Republican fundraiser on Langdon. So. <laughs> and you know what's really cool about this day? It's a day that shortly after we just won this recall election. <laughs> dozen times, but not since I was about 12 years old. Uh, my aunt, who worked at Oscar Mayer for 35 years here in town, lived here at Kennedy Manor uh, for a long, long time. So this, this, this building brings a lot of memories. And we'd always come visit my aunt here, and then go down to Pisons, University Square 4, and do, do all the things you do here. Uh, Parthenon, I, I love going to the Parthenon to get euros. I don't do it anymore now because, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not a place I typically hang out in anymore. So, you know, maybe one day. Um, Evan mentioned that the mission is not yet completed. But what these brave legislators, what these gentlemen and these gentle ladies did, was they advanced the mission really far. They looked at what was wrong with our state. They looked at the ideal that we have a government that works for the people, not the other way around, and that we have a founding principle of government by consent of the governed, and that the people who are working for the government, good people, good jobs, hard workers, they weren't contributing very much at all, if anything, to their health and retirement benefits like the taxpayers do who pay for the government that funds their jobs. You know, it's not a lot to ask. They looked at the drivers of the debt here in Wisconsin, which was making this a harder place to do business. They're looking at our economy and addressing the drivers of our problems. And they fixed it. So they ran for office, advancing principles, advancing solutions, saying that if they got elected, they would do something. And then you know what? They got in office, they won, they did it. <coughs> Go figure. <laughs> How many times have you complained about, you know, they say one thing when they're running, then they do another thing once they get there. These people did it. So we have a big mission in the federal government, and we're not quite there in advancing it. Uh, years ago, a number of us saw this crisis coming. It doesn't take a rocket scientist or an accountant or an economist to figure out you can't keep spending money you don't have. You can't keep a government that borrows 40 cents out of every single dollar the government spends and continue on. And if you want to look like how a situation like this ends, when it gets really ugly, turn on the TV when you get home and go look at Greece. Go look at Spain. Go look at Italy. Generations of politicians in all these governments, this one included, from all political parties, this one included, made a bunch of empty promises to voters to get reelected. And these are promises that the government has no means of being able to keep. And so what happens when irresponsible leaders continue to keep making these empty promises, you have a debt crisis. Because people aren't going to keep lending your government more money if you show no signs of an ability to pay it back. And then those empty promises quickly become broken promises. That's what they call austerity. That's the new buzzword. It's another word of saying, then government pulls the rug out from under you. Government reneges on the promises it made to you. And the people who get hurt the first and the worst in austerity and a debt crisis are the people who need government the most. People who have already retired. People who organize their lives and their retirement around these commitments that government made to them when they were working. That's what happens when you have a debt crisis. That's where we're going to. And so a number of us saw this coming. It's the most predictable economic crisis we've ever had in this country. 
Um, it, it reminds me of 2008, and we were advancing these budgets before then, during the last administration, in which we didn't think was going in the right direction. And I want to just ask you one quick question. What if your congressman, or your senator, or your <coughs> president, in 2008, when that crisis hit, what if they saw that one coming? Because that one did really kind of catch us by surprise. I mean, now we've gone back and we Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and the Federal Reserve and Community Reinvestment Act and banks and Wall Street and derivatives. We sort of untangled the mess and figured out what happened. But what if these leaders saw it coming? What if they knew it was going to happen? What if they knew that that crisis, which cost us trillions of dollars of wealth, has already still to this day wiped out 40% of household wealth, millions of people lost their jobs. What if they saw that crisis coming, knew when it was going to happen, knew why it was going to happen, and more importantly knew what was needed to prevent it from happening and had the time to do it, but they decided they weren't going to because it wasn't good politics. <laughs> what would you think of them? That's exactly what we're getting from Washington today. That's precisely what our president is doing today. That's precisely what the United States Senate ignoring the law of the land that says pass a budget every year is done by not passing a budget for three years. We're trying to stop that in the House. We started with this budget the plan that, that some of us worked on for a long time with eight supporters in the House of Representatives in 2007. Uh, then we got 14 in 2010 when our own party was telling people don't run on this stuff because it's, it's the third rail. You talk about Medicare and, and entitlements and debt, you, you'll, get, you, you won't, you'll get negative ads running against you, you won't win an election. And then we had all these new people come to Congress, 87 of them, who did not come for a political career, but came for the cause of saving America from preventing this crisis from getting out of control. And we've passed it now twice in the House of Representatives. We have said, here is specifically how we think we reclaim this country, how we reapply those principles that made it great, you know, liberty, freedom, free enterprise, self-determination, limited government, economic freedom, and it's those basic ideals that our founders created. You know, our rights, they come from government and God, not from, uh, they come from, excuse me, they come from nature and God, not from government. <laughs> I lost myself there. Um, and, and we've passed this stuff. But we need to advance the mission, we need another election to get the kind of leaders that are willing to make these tough decisions and get this country back on track. And so we have that proverbial fork in the road ahead of us, that choice of two futures. Do you want the American idea of an opportunity society with a safety net where you can take a risk, start a business, make a difference, succeed, and be honored for being successful? Or do we go down the path the president's proposing? A social welfare state, a cradle-to-grave society, where we have more takers than makers, where we have a debt crisis, where we manage our nation's decline, where we drain people of their incentive and will to make the most of their lives. Where we look at people who have become successful with aspersions. Where we think that there's something wrong with that. Where we pit people against each other. Talk to people as if they're fixed in some class or station in life. Victim of circumstances beyond their control and the government is here to help them cope with it. That's dour, that's cynical, that's not who we are. That's not what makes this country great. So the very kind of ideal and meaning and philosophy of this country is at stake, which determines its prosperity, which determines our freedom. We have a governing principle that's governing our, go our government right now that has no limits. Just this morning, the president announced a new policy which basically says, forget about Congress and the, and the executive branch, I'm just doing it. So there's no limiting principle here with the direction our government's going. And if we surrender so much of our power as citizens to this government, then we surrender lots of our freedom. And we surrender our ability to take risks and make a better life for ourselves, to be successful, and to be proud of that success. That's what's going on right now. And what is so heartening, what is so exciting, what is here on Langdon Street <laughs> is so great to see is that in this last recall, these state legislators put their necks on the line, voted with their conscience, voted for these principles, passed these reforms, and then were celebrated with a recall election where the governor got re-elected with a higher voting percentage at a higher turnout rate than he did the first time around. That's great. That, the way I see it, and the way I tell my, you know, these folks in Washington who are scratching their heads about this, 
the liberals think they overreached and it was and, and gosh where did all that 80 million dollars go that was supposed to come to our states but well, we absorbed it in wisconsin took a hit for the team i guess we'd say um and and what conservatives get out of this is courage works courage is what the country needs you'll be rewarded don't buckle don't back down courage was on the ballot in wisconsin on june 5th and courage won and so that's the lesson we're trying to help demonstrate to our colleagues in Washington, which is don't get intimidated, don't buckle, keep moving because America's worth fighting for. And if we get through this at the end of the day and save this country in 2013, which is what we will have to do to prevent this debt crisis from happening, we'll look back at this moment as the moment we got our country back. We reset and restored the limits to government and therefore expanded our freedom and our economy. We can be the port in the storm in the global economy. We can have an American renaissance. We can get prosperity turned back on. This economy can grow. It's not growing because of government and because of all these policies, these arbitrary policies and taxes, regulations, interest rates, and all the rest. And so the, the moral of the story here is we have a unique responsibility as Wisconsinites. There are 10 to 12 battleground states that will shape this election and therefore the direction and the trajectory of our government and our country for a long, long, long time. It's really a mathematical thing. You know, they always say this election is the most important one. Well, you know what? This one is. <laughs> because of trajectory. We will define what kind of country we're going to have, what kind of people we're going to be for a long, long time in this next election. And we as Wisconsinites have a very unique and disproportionate responsibility. Because just a handful of states will determine this thing. A handful of states, which are considered battleground on the bubble, will determine that. What we showed in 2010, is that we're moving in the right direction. We're taking it back. What we showed on June 5th is that we're building momentum on what we need to show on November 6th by sending Evan back to the state assembly, by reelecting these brave people like Joe Nyland in Janesville, is that we will get this country back. And then keep holding us accountable to make sure that we do this. And I'm really excited about it. Because what we see every time we test these things, what we see every time we look above the horizon, above the discord, the disarray, and the bongo drums and the picketers and all that stuff. <laughs> the nuns were coming on a bus to picket me on Tuesday and change me. You get rid of all this stuff. What we see is when the votes get put up, when people go to the polls, the vast majority of Americans want their country back. They want that opportunity society. They want the government to promote equal opportunity, not equal outcomes. They want the American ideal. And I think we're going to get it. So I just want to thank you for coming out here. Thank you for helping Evan. Thank you for helping these men and women who work so hard for us. They deserve and earn our respect, our support, our dollars. So thank you very much and be happy to answer questions. Paul's agreed to answer some questions, so if you have any questions. Easy ones for me, tough ones for Evan. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering, in, in, in your, um, if, if, uh, <coughs> Governor Romney wins the White House, and you guys have you don't have the Senate. What kind of things can you get through? Is there is it going to be a gridlock just because the Senate's not? Um, it it it's not an entirely easy question to answer. Uh, we need four seats to pick up to win the Senate. Obviously, this one's. You guys ever heard of Tammy Baldwin? <laughs> <laughs> This one matters a lot. <laughs> we think we have a real good shot. It's 23 Democrats are up for re-election in the Senate and only 10 Republicans. A third is up every two years. So we feel like we have a really good shot. Wisconsin clearly is a battleground. Uh, it's Tammy or one of these other four. There's a fifth guy now, I think. One of these other gentlemen running. Um, you can pass fiscal legislation and lots of this, not all of it, but much of our problems are fiscal related, which means this thing called reconciliation. That means you can't filibuster budgets. That means you only need 50 votes. So if it's Romney, you only need 50 votes and the VP makes the tiebreaker. So we need four to go. If we don't, if we get two or three and not quite the fourth, then you'll have to work with a, some, some Democrats to do things. Now there's some Democrats who agree with us on Medicare reform, on tax reform, on a lot of these things. They're, they're just not in leadership. Whenever they say they agree with us, they get pummeled by their side. But if we're in the more leadership position where we have two of the three levers of power, the House and the White House and not the Senate, 
It makes it much easier for them to come work with us. Right now, they're bludgeoned in submission not to voting with us or working with us. So I think we still, even under that scenario, have a, have a decent chance. You know, you can't repeal and replace Dodd-Frank, a regulatory thing, with 51 votes. You need 60 for that. But you can repeal, you know, at least 80% of Obamacare just on the fiscal, just on a budget vote. You can you can deal with taxes and spending and, and entitlement reform with just budget votes. You can reform the tax code with 51 votes. So there's a lot you can do short of having the majority of the Senate. If you don't have a White House, that's that's the killer. I mean, Obama got two years where he had everything. His party ran it all. They had 60 votes. They could do so talk about this Dream Act thing he did this morning. I mean, he could have done that the first two years 17 times if he wanted to. He didn't. Now it's a political pandering move where he's circumventing Congress, and which is really breathtaking. <laughs> but the point is, he passed everything he wanted to. He just didn't get cap and trade. So he passed every bill he tried and wanted except cap and trade in the first two years. In the second two years, he spent all that time regulating. So now it's just regulation after regulation. You name the industry, it's got a whole new flurry of regulations coming down the pike. And that's what the executive branch has the power to do. So if, if the executive branch stays in their hands, then, then it, it, is, it is really, really difficult. That's why this, this thing is just such high stakes. You mentioned in your list of all the things government is doing to stymie the recovery interest rates. And of course the Fed is doing everything they can to debase yeah, the currency. Right. Reward. That's what I meant when I said that. Yeah, yeah exactly. And I was wondering, what, what can government do about that? What can our elected government well, do? Well, I've advocated legislation for years uh, repealing this law called Humphrey Hawkins, which governs the Federal Reserve, and gets the Federal Reserve off of what I call the schizophrenic mandate. Which, which says they have to <coughs> pump the prime and micromanage the economy to chase employment numbers um, and watch inflation and sound money and prices. They should just have a single mandate. It's the only government agency in charge of our currency. Manage our currency so that it is stable, so that it's anchored to something, so that we have predictability and sound money and stable prices. You don't want the Federal Reserve playing with the money supply to try and manipulate growth or interest rates for employment purposes. That's what fiscal policy is for. So as a consequence, you have all this activism from the Federal Reserve disguising what I call price discovery, meaning they're building up the balance sheet, printing so much money, it's stockpiling up on banks, and, and it could give us a real whipsaw on inflation down the road. And one of the most insidious things a government can do to its people is to debase its currency. I mean, you know, Evan's talking about the lira. I, I carry with me um, different currencies. How much money do you think I have in my wallet, by the way? <laughs> I got a, yeah, I got 100 trillion, 100 billion, 20 billion, and I don't know, 42 dollars. <laughs> so yeah, 100 trillion is a Zimbabwe note, which is worth uh, less than a buck. It was uh, 100 billion was about the same. Now it's 100 trillion, and I got a Deutschmark here from the Weimar Republic. You know, this is 500 Deutschmarks. They used to carry these things in wheelbarrows to go buy bread and, and milk and things like this. What these, what these paper currencies do, this is a government cheating its people. This is a government basically cutting corners and instead of living within its means, honoring its people by keeping their money sound, the fruit of your labor is denominated in your country's currency. And what they're doing is they're printing this stuff, debasing it, and wiping out people's standards of living. There's really nothing more in cities they can do to debase your currency because it just wipes out the living standard of everybody whose savings and living is denominated in dollars. Well, all of ours are. So what I worry about is the Federal Reserve is building up so much monetary um, ease that we could have an inflation problem down the road. When we have such big deficits, so much monetary stimulus, it, it, it gives concerns in the markets that you're going to have an interest rate problem later on. It's a long-term borrowing, businesses taking risks. It puts a chilling effect. It adds to that uncertainty. That's a big problem. And so, you know, you've got to get the Federal Reserve, I believe, focused on sound money, on keeping our currency under control, and really nothing else. You know, short-term uh, liquidity just to keep things from breaking down, but they shouldn't be on these experiments where they're trying to bail out fiscal policy, and that's really what they're doing right now. Yeah, I see Chad Lee's here, too. That's the guy who was so courageous to take on Tammy Baldwin in the last election, and now he's...
Matt needs our help. Evan needs our help. Joe needs our help. All these folks. Keith, do you, you're, do you touch Dane, don't you? I'm still in Dane County. Yeah, you're still in Dane, aren't you? Yeah, the Dane. new maps, I keep forgetting. So, Dane County, we need your help. Congressman, could you expand upon, after June 5th, uh, what's your connection to the Romney campaign? What's their thought here in Wisconsin? I read a poll, Rasmussen poll yesterday for the first three. time. Yep, the governor was pulling ahead of the president. The week before the recall, the Romney campaign was within two points. There were two down, now they're three up. Uh, it's no coincidence that, that he's coming to, I talked to him this morning, he's coming to Janesville Monday morning. Um, this, and and, and the, the launch of the bus tour they're doing is the launch of their general election campaign, and they're going to the states that they think are the key battleground states, and they're coming here Monday. So that ought to tell you how serious they're taking Wisconsin. <coughs> And the reason they're taking it much more seriously now is because of the recall. I mean, it's just it's pretty obvious. Wait, how many victory centers do we have? 20, <coughs> 28 victory centers. What, what the left, you know, you have, there's this guy named Chris Van Hollen. He's my counterpart in Congress. I don't, maybe some of you know who he is. He's a big Democrat. He was the head of the Democrat campaign committee. I talked to him the day after the recall. And, and he basically intimated to me, he said, wow, we really blew that one. And we just basically... <laughs> <laughs> We really got you guys looked into shape to win Wisconsin, didn't we? I said, yeah, you did. <laughs> so we now have we had the strongest, most in, in, encouraging turnout system we've ever had before. We've got voters who are rewarding men and women in the Madison for actually sticking to their guns and having courage. And that gives us great momentum. And the Romney campaign uh, clearly recognizes that. So they're going to play here hard. They're going to. This is not going to be John McCain leaving in August. This is going to be you know, to the end, I think. <laughs> Are there going to be any other announcements in Janesville? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if Joe has one. <laughs> I had to ask. Yeah. So, uh, a lot of corporations are keeping money overseas because they don't want to get doubly taxed. Eric Bowling from uh, Fox News has suggested having a, a short window, maybe like a 90 day. Yeah, they call it repatriation. Yeah, repatriation window. You know. But what would that, you know, I mean, that's a great idea, I like that, but what would that do to like, the Greek banks and all this money, corporations? Well, I, I uh, co-authored the last repatriation, um, which we did in 2005, I think it was. And it worked, and billions of dollars came back into our country. Because what happens is, all these U.S. companies who make stuff and sell it over there, and, and therefore get the income over there, when, once they bring that money back, they get double taxed. So like, like Harley, you know, Harley, or let's say a Lunchable, you know, is sold. Oscar, I sold Oscar Mayer Lunchables one summer. It's a great product. Go buy it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> let's say Oscar Mayer sells a pallet of Lunchables in Sweden. Oscar Mayer pays the Swedish tax. Um, and any other company, you know, around the world that doesn't, they pay the Swedish tax. But in the U.S., unlike every other industrialized country, when you bring that money back that you made on selling the Lunchables, you get U.S. tax as well. So we are double taxing ourselves when every other major com company or country only single taxes their themselves. So it locks up our money. So they say, let's just have a, a window of time to bring it back. We think repatriation should be every day. So we're, our corporate tax reforms that we pass in our budget not only says that I, I'm assuming maybe Mike's business is a subchapter S corporation or a pass-through. Yeah, sub S, he pays his tax as an individual. Nine out of 10 businesses in Wisconsin pay their taxes as what we call individuals, subchapter S corporations or partnerships. Barack Obama wants their effective top tax rate to go to 44.8% in January. That's in coming in current law. Canada just lowered their tax rate on all their businesses to 15%. England's going to 22. China's at 25. We're going to 44.8. The corporate rate, the Oscar Mayer tax rate, the Harley Davidson tax rate, just really the big ones are mostly the corporations. That's 35%. And so, and if they bring the money back, then it gets taxed at 35 in addition to whatever they paid in, say, Sweden. What we're saying is top rate of 25%. So it's at least at the international average. Get rid of loopholes and, and special interest giveaways to make sure you plug the, the revenue leak and have repatriation every day. So that when you sell something overseas, you can bring the money back here and reinvest it here and create jobs here. So we want to make that an everyday occurrence. That's what our reforms do. Short of that, uh, a one-time thing would, is fine. It's just not as good as permanence. And it would. It would, it would drain money. Europe. <laughs> the, businesses are pulling money out of Europe as fast as they can. Banks are cutting their exposure as best as they can. 
So the faster you can get money out of Europe, the better. What a lot of U.S. companies are doing are just getting it out of Europe into some other country outside of Europe around the world. Not this country because of the tax rate, but they're putting it in China, they're putting it in Brazil, they're putting it in wherever, not Europe. And it would come here, for sure. Okay. Thank you, Paul, for being there. Thank you, John. <laughs>